<sighs> okay, can you all hear me and see my uh, screen here with the slide deck? Making sure you guys can hear me. All right, I'll I'll just go ahead and get started under the assumption you can you can hear me. Um make sure that, that works. All right. So uh, what today we'll we'll sort of start off with the same uh, format as we've done before. Um, we'll uh, do a molecule of the lecture. Uh, we'll we'll polish off what we started last week, and then we'll we'll finally get to the um, organic chemistry as a second language, and look at some of the IR spectra uh, that are present in the the second semester topics. Uh, for that, so we can get some practice in interpreting IR. So here is our um, our molecule of the lecture, the QR code. If you want to get your uh, camera or tablet out and scan that QR code, it's going to bring up the molecule, which is named at, at the top here. So even though this name is pretty long, 4S6-chloro, 4-2-cyclopropyl ethyl, 4 trifluoromethyl, 2 4 dihydro, 1 H, 3 1 benzoxazine 2 ohm. So, again, that's uh, a pretty, pretty long name, uh, but again, we'll see how you convert names into actual structures uh, as the semester moves on, and it's actually not that intimidating. So, the, the end of the name is basically the parent. It tells you what the main functional group is, and then everything in front of that are substituents on the parent uh, structure. So hopefully you've scanned that. I'll bring the structure up on the next slide, and we'll look. We'll examine some features of it, talk a little bit about of it, and then and then we'll have uh, four questions pertaining to it. So here is the molecule of the lecture in the bond line form. Uh, it's, its generic name is efavirenz, and the um, brand name is Sestiva, uh, which is sold by Merck Pharmaceuticals. So that's the, the label for uh, Merck there. And its therapeutic indication is it's an antiretroviral. And specifically, the mechanism of action, it inhibits reverse transcriptase. Um, so it's used to treat uh, HIV type 1. So it's an inhibitor of that uh, enzyme. So if you're not familiar with some of the research going on here at USM, Dr. Jacques Kessel uh, studies HIV. So he's um, discovered, developed assays for a specific enzyme in the uh, HIV life cycle wow. called integrase. So my group uh, and, and Dr. Piggs's group uh, collaborate with providing Dr. Kessel small molecule inhibitors of, of integrase. So uh, the antral retrovirals work on a different enzyme in HIV called uh, transcriptase. So we should be able to pick out some of the common functional groups at this point in the molecule. Again, the bond line, way of communicating it. Here's the ball and stick. Um, and then this, this right here is, um, so the container, you can see that this is the actual brand name from Merck Sestiva. And notice here, it says 200 milligrams, uh, and here it says 50 milligrams. So my understanding that for antiretrovirals, um, the dose is, is, is typically quite high. I, I think they also dose this in 600 milligrams as well. And this is what a common pill looks like. Um, so the higher this number, 
this milligram dosage um, that that sort of um, presents a lot of technical challenges if you were the company such as Merck that had to go ahead and you know if you have to produce more of this compound per dose per patient that that presents a lot of technical issues uh, and again when you're in lab your 255 lab in your um, I, don't just go through the motions think about what you're doing for each unit of operation and why you're doing it and imagine yourself whatever you're doing if you had to make like a metric ton of the final product you're, you're doing or if you had to separate by distillation a metric ton of material imagine the infrastructure required for that so let me go ahead and ask you a couple questions on this molecule here so which of the following functional groups are present in efavirenz so type your your choice a letter choice in the chat box and we can have a discussion So what do you guys think? What functional groups do you see present in efavirenz? Maybe my, my chat is not updating. I don't know. Don't see any responses in the chat. Um, all of the responses so far have been C. Okay, my yeah, my chat's not updating then. I think my internet's kind of wonky today. Okay, so I'll, I'll have to take your word for it that responses are, are being input. So yeah, it, it appears that C would be the correct answer. So we have an alkyne. So again, that's a carbon-carbon triple bond. We have a benzene ring. We have a cyclopropyl group. So we haven't talked about that nomenclature yet, but we know that propane is a three carbon unit. Cyclo, that means a ring. So that's a substituent cyclopropyl and then trifluoromethyl. We see a methyl group here with, with three fluorines, so that's the trifluoromethyl. So all of these other ones have basically a distractor answer uh, that's not present. There's no carboxylic acid, there's no bromide, uh, and there's no acid or ketone. So the best choice is C. So I'll have to sort of rely on you guys to uh, uh, turn the audio off and give me some feedback uh, as the as the chat isn't updating for me. Could you try typing something into your chat? Sure. All right, so it's not an issue of being on the wrong one. Um, so you see what I typed in there? Yes, sir. OK, yeah, mine, mine's just not updating, I guess. We'll, uh, we'll power through, though. Uh, so the next question here, uh, the mass spectrum of efavirenz would have which of the following features? So consider the functional groups present in the molecule and try to recall um, diagnostic signals that you would see in mass spec based on those functional groups.
so what do you what do you think uh, again you'll have to sort of relay to me what the major answers are Anyone want to take a shot? There's a few coming in with C. So yeah, again, C, C, C would be the best choice for this. Um, a parent ion, M to Z with M. So, so parent is typically given the, the designation M in these square brackets and the plus means it's a, a positively charged ion. So that's your M mass and then your parent plus two mass at a ratio of three to one. And what is what is that indicative of? What halogen three to one ratio in the parent region? Chlorine. So yeah, chlorine is going to be the best um, best response for that. So again, these are all related to all these answers are related to uh, halogen uh, signatures and mass spec. So let's let's examine uh, choice A. Which halogen would give a prominent signal at m to z equal 127? So we've we've said C is related to chlorine. What do you think A is related to? Alicia says iodine. Yeah, so A is the iodine signal uh, and basically um, what what that means is it's an indirect sort of detection in a sense. Um, you're, you're actually seeing the halogen that that relates to the I plus ion at 127. So what's happening is the parent loses the iodine and you actually see it um, in the mass spec. You know when we compare that to choice C, you're, you're seeing the ratio of chlorine 35 to 37 in the parent, so it's retained. So what does B relate to? Which halogen? A one to one ratio would probably be bromine. So yeah, bromine is going to be um, the one-to-one -one ratio where you have bromine 79 and, and bromine 81. So again, the difference between those two, they're isotopes. So that's your M and M plus two. That's where you see like the one-to-one -one ratio. So we have iodine, bromine, chlorine, and then obviously the last one, D, is going to be fluorine. Remember, fluorine is 100% is abundant for its, its normal isotope. And it, it's not really going to have any of those diagnostic uh, signals. Um, so you, you have three fluorines in here, but they're not going to be indicated like these other ones would be. Okay. So I how many? You, I have, yeah. Um, so I've read all of chapter 14. I haven't gotten to 15 yet. And I was wondering how we're supposed to be able to like 
tell um, like this ratio and the peaks and stuff without the chart? Like how I, I don't know how to do it for the molecule alone. So typically they're either going to give you like visually you can see the spectrum. And just as a review, the, the parent ion is is the highest mass that you're going to see in that spectrum. So it's the one furthest to the right. So at zero, we have zero mass and then we're increasing mass as we read to the right. So the parent's always the highest mass. So visually, you'll either see the M and M plus two, you'll actually see like the signals, the lines, or they'll tell you um, the data of M and M plus two in their ratios. So they might say, um, they might not tell you they occur in one to one, they might say their abundance is like 10% and 10%. And so from those two numbers, you say, okay, compare them, that's one to one. So okay, alternatively, okay, I'll, like alternatively for chlorine, if they said the M was 30% and M plus two was 10%. Um, I have another question. I don't really understand how C is three to one. Like, can you maybe explain that a little bit further? So, okay, my, my chat finally updated here, thank God. Um, so the question was, how is it C in three to one? So when we look at the molecule and you're, you're visually identifying functional groups, you see a chlorine present. So chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes, 35 and 37, and they, their ratio to each other is, is three to one. So of the four total parts, Every time there's four, three of them are going to be chlorine 35, and then one of them is going to be chlorine 37. So if you think of this efavirenz, if you sample that like bulk, that like a bulk sample of that. So for every four, three of them are going to have chlorine 35, and the fourth one is going to have chlorine 37. So what we're saying here is the parent that has the chlorine 35 is going to be 3 to the M plus 2 parent that has chlorine 37. And that's what gives rise to that 3 to 1 ratio in the parent region. Okay, so are we supposed to know that chlorine is in a 35 to 37? Yeah, that's that's basically something that you'll uh, have to memorize for lack of a better word. So of the halogens, you have fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine going down the group. Fluorine really doesn't have a, a specific signature in mass spec. Chlorine is the three to one ratio. Bromine is one to one and iodine. You have the peak at 127. So of the techniques of this, of this, um, this, the instrumental techniques we're learning, mass spectrometry is particularly useful for de determining if a halogen is present. In, in infrared spectroscopy, really, that technique is not good for determining halogens because the carbon halogen bond stretchings are in the fingerprint region, and it's really hard to to suss out those details. Hey, Dr. Donahue, so what would it look like if there was like both a chlorine and a bromine? What would the peaks look like in that situation? So let me let me switch over to the doc cam. So maybe Maybe let's let's take it um, a bit simple to begin with, because so let's consider. Can you all see that? So let's just consider bromine.
So bromine is bromine 79 and bromine 81, and we know they occur in a one to one ratio. And that's the reason I want to consider just this scenario first, because what, what Mac is asking, if it's chlorine and bromine together, the, the, it's, it can get a little bit more difficult to visually figure out how that peak would look, but I can show you through this example, how you might want to think about it. So say you have, let's just say for simplicity's sake, CH3Br, so just methyl bromide. So really what that is, And so this is what I mean by, by this molecule would be the M plus, and this would be M plus two. So see the difference, 89 minus 79, that's where you get that plus two. So if we had, um, let me just get out my calculator. I'm pretty bad at doing math fast. So 79, plus 12, plus 3, that's 94, right? So we're, we're just adding these two here. So this M to Z is equal to 96. So if, if this molecule, if this is what you're analyzing, methyl bromide, So again, here is your abundance on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is your m to z. So these parents, you would see them, say they say this molecule, the parent was 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 ionized to say 50% abundance. That's how often you see it. So at 94. So we'll say this is zero, this is 50, this is 100. So at a mass of 94, you would have, and I'm just arbitrarily picking this abundance. This M to Z of 94, at the M plus two, you would see a peak at the exact same height. So there's M, and there's M plus two, and I arbitrarily chose that they would be 50% abundant. So is everyone clear on that? Um, the only question I have is why is the first one CH3 and the second one CH2? Or is it CH3? It's really blurry. Uh, I apologize for that. They're both CH3. Maybe All I right, can move it closer. I'll try to write a little clearer as well. This this is a, a $96 doc cam from Amazon, so it's not the highest quality. I apologize for having to move it around so much. Okay, so now let's let's get to uh, the the heart of what. Mac was asking, what if you have multiple halogens? So I'm just going to take this and I'm going to add two bromines now. So CH2Br2. So now we have two bromines. So what we have to consider is that the possible scenarios for what those two bromines can be. Knowing that bromine occurs in a one-to-one -one ratio of 79 bromine and 81 bromine. So what do, what do we mean by the scenarios? So we'll just do the same thing we did up here. CH379Br, CH381Br. 
So let's let's focus on this. There's two bromines. What if they're both 79 CH2, 79 Br, 79 Br? Does that make sense? Now, what if the first one is CH2, 79 Br? And the second one is 81 BR. So the next scenario, CH2, the first one now is going to be 81 BR. The second one is going to be 79 BR. And then the last scenario is CH2, where they're both 81. Now you consider this is unique, right? That occurs once. Look at these next two. We've written 79 BR, 81 BR, then 81 BR, 79 BR. So essentially, this is occurring twice. Then the last one, they're both 81, so that's occurring once. So what is all of this telling you? That the parent region, M to Z, you should now see three peaks in a one to two to one ratio. So what, what are these masses? Let's just calculate that. So I'm going to take 12 plus 2, that's 14, plus 79, plus 79. So this first mass is 172. The second mass I'm going to take 14 again, plus 79, plus 81. So that's 174. Now the second time we do this, we get 14, plus 81, plus 81. That gets us the 176. So this is where you're going to see the parent region. So if we redraw our mass spec, Say zero, one hundred, two hundred. So this is the M to Z. This is the abundance. So fifty, one hundred percent abundance. So we're 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 one fifty here. We're one seventy five here. And I draw these in. This parent manifold has to occur in a, a one to two to one ratio. So say we're about here. Say the first one is is twenty five percent. The two is then fifty percent, and then this one is twenty five percent. So it, it sort of has that one to two to one look to it. Does everyone follow that logic? So not that I want to avoid the specific question that Mac is asking if there was chlorine and bromine, but hopefully you, you could see that if you had this molecule CH2BRCL, 
this is going to be a bit more complicated now because the ratio of the chlorines is three to one. The ratio of the bromines is one to one. So these ratios are not, are not necessarily going to be as clean looking as that, if that makes sense. OK, I see where you're going. What what I can do is I'll, I'll look up this, the mass spec signature of this and you'll see that it gets pretty complicated just because you're mixing these different ratios together. So I'll, I'll follow up with that with a, a post in Canvas just so you can see how how complicated it can get. OK, thanks. Yeah. So any any questions before we move on to the next um, uh, question about ephavirins? So just to make sure I understand the um, like the M plus two and all that is that, that that's the result of the different um, like the so like if BR eighty one would cause the M plus two right in the parent ion because it's plus two neutrons. Yeah, so that that's where this number is coming from. This plus two, it comes from the heavier isotopes. See the difference between them, 81 and 79. That's the plus two. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, so our next question here is how many unique type of carbon atoms are present in ephavirins? Not sure if anyone answered yet. But my chat's really not updating if people have answered. So unique type of carbons. How many unique type of carbons do you see? Your check came through. Um, all the answers so far have been A. OK, yeah, my, my chat is uh, not updating any more then. So let, let's go through and count these before I give the answer. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are all unique. They're all bonded to different things. Man, this. So six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, there's 12, right? So 12 can't be the answer. Fifteen can't be the answer because that's too many carbons. So it's between 13 and 14. What do you think it is? 13 or 14? So when you look at this group, there's symmetry about sort of this plane. So there'll be 12, 13, because this is equivalent to that. So the molecule has 14 total carbons, but only 13 are unique. Is that everyone, everyone get that?
I'll, I'll go ahead and assume so. So let's let's move on to the next question. How many of each type of carbon hybridization are present in efavirenz? So you're counting sp3, sp2, and sp. So again, you're counting the, the, the total type of each. So you're not really looking for symmetry so much at this point. You're just counting the total type of each hybridization. What do you guys think? Again, my chat's not updating anymore. Some A's, one B. So yeah, A is going to be the correct answer. Uh, B, B is sort of the distractor answer, again, because it's asking how many total of each type? So sp3 hybridized carbon. We have one, two, three, four, five. If we were considering symmetry, it would be less because those two are the same, but it, total it's, it's five. sp2, we have these six and then seven. SP, those are present in the alkyne. There's one, there's two. So again, we've we've taken the carbon count. We've thought about hybridization and we've got some resolution amongst those different carbons. And again, this is all leading somewhere. I promise you that because it's, it's going to help when we start looking at actual carbon data. So Maybe what I can do now is I'm going to switch over to the workbook and then uh, with the last couple minutes, we'll switch back to uh, considering this problem that we had left off on um, last Friday. So let me switch this around. And can you all see the workbook now? So again, this is the IR and spectroscopy um, materials are in the second um, the second semester. Again, they're chapters uh, 14 and 15 in your main textbook. The reason that I cover them in the first semester is because as we learn reactions, we want to understand how we can prove that we actually made a product. So let's go ahead. We're on page 21 of the second semester workbook. This is problem 2.9. It's asking for each IR spectrum below. Identify whether it is consistent with the structure of an alcohol a carboxylic acid or neither. So when you look at this IR spectrum, is it an alcohol, an acid, or neither? Could you please tell us what the top looks like? I missed that of the page where it would be in the workbook. This is page 21 in the second semester workbook. All right, thank you. Yeah. Maybe what I can do is uh, open. Ba, 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 ba. I'm going to bring this over. OK, hopefully, can you all see this, this new slide that I put up? 
uh, from a couple chats ago, infrared regions. So I'll, I'll have to rely on some some feedback from the participants here. We can see it. Uh, what, what do you what do you think this spectrum shown in the workbook is? Probably an alcohol. So we have an answer of an alcohol. Remember, the alcohol has the OH functional group. And if, if you're looking at this slide deck here, um, the, the main diagnostic peak that's present in this spectrum is this broad signal here that I'm tracing in blue. And that belongs to the OH stretch. So one thing, in my opinion, uh, and again, I don't want you guys like trying to go nuts memorizing things because IR can definitely be frustrating in some sense. Let me just say that when I'm scanning these wave numbers here, this X axis, and I, I look at, I find 1500, and I'm just going to draw a line. So anything over here, 1500 and below, for all intent and purposes, you can ignore. Because this stuff gets super complicated. Unless you're an expert in interpreting IR, you're going to have a very hard time point pulling out of there what that data is. So IR is very good for diagnostic peaks that each functional group has. So how do we know this is not a carboxylic acid? So if we look at the slide deck, we see region three, a carboxylic acid. What is the main functional group? It has this carbonyl and then OH. Notice this spectrum has an OH, but it does not have a carbonyl in this region. See, there's no peak here. That's how we arrive at the conclusion that it's an alcohol. It's the lack of the carbonyl stretch. The other thing I want to point out is, see this? I'm going to trace it in gray. These peaks here, those almost always belong to sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching. So think about everything you've learned so far. Pretty much every molecule has this functional group, right? So you're always going to see peaks in this region. So that's not very diagnostic. Any questions on this one before we, we go to the next the next one in this um, problem? So we're on uh, 210 now. And again, the, the question is, given this spectrum, is it an alcohol, a carboxylic acid, or neither? So yeah, my, my chat has has frozen as of eleven fifteen. There are answers of neither. So 
So again, what, what organic chemistry and interpreting data is going to expose your thought processes to um, so what what this spectrum is showing you is basically the lack of those functional groups. Again, if we look in this region, what I call region one on the slide deck, the XH region, there's no OH peak here, right? You see, you see the baseline is traveling and it only dips down when you get into that region again where we said it was sp3 hydro sp3 carbon h stretching there's no oh group there so we recognize that we say no alcohol and if you were if you were taking a face to face exam that i had written i would always you always encourage you to write stuff like this down because this, the more stuff you write down, the less you have to like put in your mental memory. So we, we keep scanning. We get we get past the the normal alkane type stretching. We're going. We see nothing in the in region three, the double bond region. There's no peaks, so no carbonyl. So this is no acid. So it's going to be neither. So that's how you need to think about solving these problems is, is looking at what you're given, understanding it, and being very rational about your thoughts. So let's let's check out the next one here, 211. What do you think about this one? So an, another thing I might point out before we get some feedback, when, when you're given data of any type, don't, um, don't sort of make assumptions about how like pretty it looks. And, and what I mean by that is, notice how this, where this baseline starts. The baseline starting at about 50% transmittance. In your mind, you might ask, why doesn't it start at 100? Why is it? Why isn't it like the, the 100 here? So what you observe instrumentally, you know, the, the output might not fit your assumptions of how it should look. But when you're scanning, when you're looking at this from left to right, do you think it's an acid, an alcohol or neither? The class says carboxylic acid. So acid is the, the correct answer. And so how do we get that? We're, we're tracing along our eyes reading. We're dipping down. See, see how we're dipping down around 3,700 here? And then it's, it's really broad. And we're going back up. So this is attributed to OH. We're scanning, we're scanning, we're back up to the like the baseline here. And then we're going back down 15, 16, we're at about 1700. And we're going back up. And we know that beyond 1500, we don't have to consider. So this is typical of a carbonyl. So again, the acid functional group has the carbonyl and the OH. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this back a little bit so you can see the next one in frame with the current one. So we looked at this and we said, okay, we recognize there's OH, there's a carbonyl, that's an acid. Look at this one now. This is 212. 
when you look at that, what do you immediately think? It looks like the first one we did at the beginning. So it looks like the first one, which we said was an alcohol, right? So if what is helpful when you're learning to interpret this, and again, there's not very many of you that are going to go on to do this for life, but if you go to med school, vet school, whatever, and you're given someone's EKG data that's that's measuring their their electrical rhythms of their heart, or you're you're given X-ray data of a bone. How do you know what the normal healthy situation is versus the abnormal or unhealthy situation? You have to look at a lot of data and understand what is normal. And then when someone has an injury or a disease, how that affects the normal data. So our question is considering alcohol versus acid. So when I look at these two, I see that this OH peak here is different. Then I look here and I, there's, there's no carbonyl here. So immediately that tells me the presence of the OH, the lack of the carbonyl, this has to be an alcohol. The other thing I want to point out about this, and it, it may seem sort of subtle, but notice the shape of this OH group. We're at baseline, we're dropping down, we hit the maximum absorbance, then we're going back up. And notice how it's almost, it's almost back up to the baseline, right? And then it drops back down. Well, look at the OH for the acid now. Notice that it, it does not go back up. So I, I sort of call this region here like baseline separation between the OH and the SP3 hybridized carbon H stretching. See how it goes back up? In here it does not. It's really broad. So that's another indicator that coupled with the carbonyl that you have an acid present. Any questions on that before we, we look at some more from the workbook? Okay, let's... Um, Maybe let's do sort of a different type of problem from the workbook. So you can sort of see how all this stuff starts to come together. This is page 27, exercise 221. It says a compound with the molecular formula C6H10O gives the following IR spectrum. So right off the bat, you have a couple pieces of data, the molecular formula, and you have IR spectrum. The first thing I want you to do without even looking at this, how many degrees of unsaturation are present in this molecular formula? C6H10O. I think it's two. So we're going to get two 
degrees of unsaturation. Does everyone remember how we calculated that? Again, we're using CnH2n plus 2. N is equal to 6. So that should be C6H14. So for six carbons, we should have 14 hydrogens. But what we do have is C6H10 because oxygen neither adds nor subtracts. So that gets us H4. A degree of unsaturation is H2, so 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2. OK, so now we have another piece of data. When you're looking at this spectrum, what, what sticks out in your mind? What's, what's sort of the main thing you see? There are two peaks in the diagnostic region. So which, which two are you specifically referring to? The one at 1650 and the one at 1720. So let's let's focus on this one here at 1720. Notice it's it's sharp. Sharp and intense from the, the sort of the baseline at 100. We're going down to pretty much zero transmittance, which is 100% absorbance. So what does that peak belong to? What sort of functional group? So notice what the IR spectrum, what this does not tell you is really how any of these elements in this molecular formula are bonded to one another other than these sort of diagnostic peaks. So what does this diagnostic peak belong to? A carbonyl. So there you go, carbonyl. CO double bond. Now notice what's present in there. That's one degree of unsaturation, right? So we've accounted by looking at the IR, there's a carbonyl that is one degree of unsaturation. The molecule total has two degrees of unsaturation. So I have to flip the page to show you These are the, the possible choices. Hopefully you can see that. Identify the structure. Identify the structure below that is most consistent with the spectrum. So I'm going to put some, some letters under here. A, B, C, D, E, F. G, H. Which of these can we eliminate based on the fact that we know there's a carbonyl? We could eliminate A, C, D, F, and G. So that leaves us B, E, and H. So you're probably thinking, OK, they each each has a carbonyl, right? So we've just eliminated the ones without a carbonyl. So the other thing we recall, so this was one degree of unsaturation. 
we, we still have one degree of unsaturation to account for. Can we eliminate any of these if they do not have a second degree of unsaturation? Yeah, we can eliminate B. Well, so there's the one, and this would be the second one. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, so that actually does have two degrees of unsaturation. So this, this also has two, and then H also has two. So I'm just going to flip back to the data real quick. So there's, there's really not much else in here. Uh, maybe one maybe one thing I could point out. So if I go to 3000, all I did was draw a line from 3000 up. And as we learn the functional groups, if you see a peak greater than 3000, such as this peak here. That's indicative of an sp2 hybridized carbon H stretch. So that that is that's a clue we can use as well. It's a little bit more subtle. But it is it is a, a major clue. So if we flip back here. Another clue we have is CSP2H. We sort of see that in the aldehyde. We see it here in this alkene, and we see it here in this alkene. So this, this one, you might use the word a little bit tricky. Um, but I, I think the best answer is E because this this has a diagnostic peak and then the presence of this alkene right next to that carbonyl will lead to a lower carbonyl stretch than what we see at 1720. So this one would actually be below 1700. This CH stretch would actually be below 3000. And so I think the best answer is probably E. But but we've gone through enough logic to narrow it down, uh, increases our chances of uh, getting it correct. And we can explain um, those subtle differences between these three in, in probably the next chat session because we're a little bit over time right now and I don't want to take up too much more of your time if you have another class you have to uh, to get to work on. So if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email. Um, I'll, I'll post some of those mass spec resources uh, in Canvas so you can see those different halogen ratios. Uh, other than that, uh, work on your homeworks and your Orions and we'll, we'll see you Wednesday, okay?